to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Justin Clark. I'm Adam O'Cronin. And today we're discussing the future of artificial intelligence. So that means we'll get into when experts predict we'll achieve artificial general intelligence or AGI, whether or not AGI will be beneficial to humanity, the impacts of AGI across different sectors of society, how we might go about developing provably beneficial AI, and the latest, most cutting-edge breakthroughs in AI that are being uh, realized right now. But first, let's talk about what Sam Harris calls the failure of intuition regarding mm-hmm. AI. So, like, why is it so hard to actually worry about AI as opposed to worrying about something like mass starvation, nuclear war, or climate change? Yeah, so I kind of think of this as similar to how dogs are naturally afraid of a snake, but they're not naturally afraid of cars, right? So your Mm -hmm. dog will run into the street and possibly get hit by a car because it's not ingrained in the dog's limbic system to be afraid of something Mm -hmm. that's a big machine that was created by, you know, monkey man. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's kind of similar where it's not ingrained in us to be afraid of something like AI and it takes a lot of high level abstract reasoning to even get to the point where you would think of hmm, maybe this is something we should worry about. So I would say that's that's one of the reasons. The, the other reason that uh, which Sam Harris points out is that dying from famine isn't fun dying from a sci-fi apocalypse is fun (laughs) so it's like (laughs) it's kind of fun to talk about ai and robots taking over and Mm -hmm. especially with how hollywood plays plays it and the media plays it so it makes it hard to actually worry about this on par with other issues like you know you you brought up nuclear war or climate Mm -hmm. change Um, Mm -hmm. and then the final reason that i'll say is that there's a lot of cognitive biases here so if you're telling a smart person like Neil deGrasse Tyson, for instance, that one day there's going to be a machine smarter than himself. That's hard to hear for a lot of smart people. Mm -hmm. And also, humans have been the most intelligent species on Earth for so long that we almost take it as a law of physics that nothing will be smarter than ourselves. Mm -hmm. But there have been, like, we have only been the smartest being for, you know, however many million years and you know elephants have more neurons in their brains than we do there were formerly the smartest being on earth that got usurped by humans so there's no real reason to think that we're the end in the chain of intelligence right yeah and i think those are all really good points and then i would just add one more point that you can't even see ai like it it's almost like mm-hmm. the reason why some people don't worry about climate change where like you can't really see the effects always it's something that's a little ephemeral and not really in sight like you don't think about it and you don't right. think about how it drives your behavior like for social social media um, interaction for example a lot of your usage is driven by ai and the learnings that come from you know, the masses using Instagram are driven by AI. Mm -hmm. But we don't really think about that. The average person doesn't think about that normally, unless you sort of know what's going on in the background. Right. Or like the results you get in Google are the result of AI. And you think, oh, I'm deciding what I type into the search bar and I'm deciding Mm -hmm. what I click on. But you're not deciding what results you see. So there Mm -hmm. are lots of ways that AI can sort of point humanity in one direction or the other in very subtle Mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's good that, you know, if if I'm searching on Google and I've been looking at some, let's say I'm looking at, you know, how to do something in Python or something in a programming language and it, Google can use my my previous results and what is helpful to answer my question for me more quickly. Or like we've, we've talked about this before, it can drive people you know, maybe an example is Facebook. It can drive people to extremes because it's le- this this machine learning algorithm in the background is learning what you're more likely to engage with, which tends right. to be uh, content that's a little bit more, um, you know, inflammatory and yeah. and a little bit more extreme. So right, and those are all examples of AI systems that exist today. 
Mm -hmm. But I guess when we're talking about artificial general intelligence, it might be good to take a step back and sort of explain what we mean. And so AGI is basically the ability to accomplish any task as well as a human. Mm -hmm. and, and this would be like pretty much any, any task being better than, what do you think? So I, I've seen that the definition is a little fuzzy. So do you think general intelligence is like, this this AI system can accomplish anything better than the best human, like. Or, well, general intelligence would be as well as as a human, but if super intelligence would be better than the best human. So yeah, but, and, and a lot of the arguments talk about, and I mean I sort of believe this myself as well. If if it's a self improving system, if it reaches just human level intelligence. That is, it's not right. going to stop It'll quickly there. surpass yeah. human intelligence. Yeah, it's probably going to only be at human level intelligence for, let's say, I don't know how long, let's say a day maximum, and then it's going to just keep going further. Right. But a lot of what we're saying right now may sound far fetched. So I want to start with mm -hmm. what the naysayers would say. Like, what did the skeptics say about AGI? that either it's never going to occur, we're never going to really achieve it, or we will achieve it, but it's not something we really need to worry about. I want to really address their claims, because if we can properly address their claims, then mm -hmm. you know we can go into the discussion of how do we actually make sure that AGI is developed in a provably beneficial way, um, mm -hmm. and you know strategies for doing that. So yeah. it seems like there are those four real camps. Either we will develop it or we won't develop it, and then either it will be beneficial or it won't be beneficial. So yeah. people like Neil deGrasse Tyson are in the camp that, oh yeah, we'll develop it, but it's not something we need to worry about. And people mm -hmm. in this camp seem to have the idea that it would have to specifically want to do something bad of its own volition for it to be a problem for us. And why would a machine ever do that? Like all the machines up until now pretty much do exactly what we want them to do. But it seems like this is sort of misunderstanding the problem. And the problem is mm -hmm. the value alignment problem. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure the values of AI that are more intelligent than us by definition of what we're, what we're referring to, how do we make sure those values are aligned with our own? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you just think about how basic laws that are in place in the world right now can cause misaligned incentives, that causes a lot of harm in, you know, in the human race. And that's just like self-imposed, right? Like, we're, they're just misaligned incentives. And if we're misaligned with an artificial intelligence system, then it can lead to pretty catastrophic results. You know, there's right. the whole... Yeah, I mean, the idea is that even if our values are misaligned slightly, because the machine is so competent, those slight differences would be amplified to a tremendous degree. So there's some interesting examples here, like obviously there's the famous paperclip maximizer, where you know you build a paperclip maximizer and then pretty soon it takes all the atoms in the world and even atoms in human bodies and turns them into paperclips. There's you know even the example of let's say you do something totally seemingly innocuous, like you build an AI that's just supposed to solve some really hard mathematical problem, like an almost mm -hmm. impossible mathematical problem. Then the machine could do the same sort of thing where it basically turns all of Earth's resources into computing hardware so that it can try to solve this problem and it doesn't care about other you know, lives, life on mm -hmm. Earth. You know, another one is the happiness problem. If you set the goal of just, uh, you know, amplifying human happiness, it could just basically strap everyone down and flood their brains with dopamine. Um, mm. So it, 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 when you consider all of these, all of these value alignment problems, it becomes really difficult to think of how could we actually build values into a machine that will prove to be beneficial, even as this machine becomes far more intelligent than ourselves, especially considering mm -hmm. that even humans can't agree on what the right values are. Like, yeah. What we would consider the right values versus China, or even what I would consider the right values compared to you, may mm -hmm. be slightly different. So how do you factor that in and build that 
into the system in a provably beneficial way. Yeah, I mean that's that's the problem. You know, yeah. that's that's the problem that needs to be solved. It seems like we would need a sort of AI version of the Ten Commandments or some sort of rule system that says like these rules must not be broken ever. Like those are just kind of the rules. But the problem is with AI, like you need to define you need to define some sort of objective function. But what I've noticed just in life if you're walking around and just observing, you realize that there are thousands or maybe millions or billions of different uh, objective functions that can exist for individual creatures and mm-hmm. individual humans. Like me walking around and, you know, or going to the kitchen and eating food, my objective function is some really complicated thing or if i'm playing football or if i'm playing baseball or if i'm playing basketball like objective functions change depending on what the context is we're going to need some sort of system that has a limitless amount of objective functions but we need these rules in place that will like keep them from keep the system from doing anything really crazy so I don't know what your thoughts are on on this. I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, so I I tend to take the line of Stuart Russell, who wrote the book Human Compatible, which just came mm-hmm. out in October 2019. And he had this aha moment when he was walking down the street in Berkeley. And he was thinking about this very problem of how do you align values? And formerly, you would always basically set the goal And then you figure out how to get there. So the goal is beat the world champion and go. And then the machine basically runs all of these, uh, you know, iterations of iterations of the go game until it can achieve that end goal. But he thought about what if we invert, invert the value function. And so he calls this inverse um, IRL. It's inverse recursive learning. So basically he has these three parts of inverse recursive learning. The first part is the machine's only objective is to maximize the realization of human preferences. The second part is the machine is initially uncertain about what those preferences are. And the third point is the ultimate source of information about human preference is human behavior. So if you had a system like this that has been built to figure out what human preferences are and it's uncertain about them, then there will always be meaningful human input into the system. And it would sort of be like the machine sort of evolves alongside humans while sort of taking the lead from human behavior to decide what to do next. So an example Mm -hmm. he gives is like, you could have uh, an AI assistant, like travel agent, uh, you know, robot, that basically tries to find the best seats for you on airplanes. And so first, it doesn't know what your preference is with regard to seats. So it just sort of observes you and sees how you buy airline tickets. And it finds that, you know, one time you buy a window seat, but then the next time you buy an aisle seat because the window seat's a little bit more expensive. And you never really buy a middle seat unless there's just no other options available. So over time, mm-hmm. the system would learn your preferences and it would get to know you perhaps even better than you would even really know yourself or that you would really understand your own value function. Um, hmm. So this seems to be the most promising path forward for creating provably beneficial AI. However, it's, it's not always easy to go from you know three bullet points written down in, in plain English to actually mm-hmm. coding this thing into the machine. So. So I'm curious from your perspective as a as a programmer and someone who's, you know, worked with some machine learning systems, mm-hmm. like how you sort of view that leap of, you know, understanding maybe philosophically how we can solve the value alignment problem to actually solving it. Yeah, so I think the closest parallel that we've seen right now cuz right now you know, we, we're taking baby steps, right? Like this AGI value alignment thing is something that we don't need to worry about for a reasonable amount of time because we're not even close in terms of the technology of developing a system that's capable of doing more than one thing that well or maybe more than a couple things that well. Um, but anyways, 
right depends now. what you so, mean by a long time but yeah i take your like, point like like five i think like five ten years i, I, I wouldn't consider okay. that a long time <laughs> fair enough fair enough well but really in terms of ai development that is sort of a long time you know if you right. think of what kind of progress can take but, place but the average person thinks like oh i'm gonna pretty much live in the same world when i die as i am now and my kids are gonna have a okay, similar no, world no. of going to college and getting a job and so compared from that point of view this is like an exponential game paradigm shifting change mm -hmm. yeah so so let today i think the closest problem is understanding natural language so we have mm. these ephemeral like philosophical ideas of what you know these commandments or these rules that this ai needs to follow for example that you were just talking about and what i mentioned earlier um we don't really we need to be able to translate that into some sort of mathematical representation mm -hmm. because the ai system needs to be able to perform mathematical operations that's the that's the fundamental structure of every single machine learning algorithm is just mathematical operations mm -hmm. so that's the first step is we somehow need to convert that what we do with natural language which i think is sort of the closest thing so um in natural language processing algorithms, we somehow need to convert words and sentences into a mathematical object. And a lot of times what's done is converting sentences, words, paragraphs into vectors, which is, you know, it's just a, a mathematical representation of these words. The problem I see with that and the reasons why natural language processing is so hard is because we lose information when we do that. We lose this, mm. some information that humans have of words in natural language that just isn't being translated into a mathematical representation um, without losing a bunch of information or at least essential information. You know, we might preserve 80, 90% of the information that was in, you know, the original sentence, but there's something that we have, or at least that our our brain structure can take advantage of, that makes it way easier to understand the words than the mathematical representations. And you know, I, I don't really know how we can how how it's going to be a, a perfect solution. Right. Um, I mean, I know so, like Google for, Google search, for instance, used to have a pretty rudimentary system where when you translated something from one language to another, it basically just had different words that were equivalents in different languages and it matched mm -hmm. them up and that's how it would translate. But mm -hmm. now it actually extracts meaning from that word and then will basically find the meaning of the whole sentence and then translate the whole sentence into the other language, which is why oftentimes the translation will change like partway through you typing because it'll understand mm. the whole sentence. Yeah, and, and sentence structures are different in different languages. And right. that's, the, that's the thing with, so you mentioned meaning, you know, the mm -hmm. meaning of the sentence, but really the meaning is just a vector representation of the words. Which, or a what do you mean by, ve by vector representation? So, so there's this whole thing, one of the popular um, things that, uh, is done in natural language processing is something called word to vec That's another thing that Google uh, developed. There are some other um, techniques, but basically it's translating words into um, like a, a mathematical space or a vector space, which is just, mm. you know, a, a big structure of numbers essentially that mm -hmm. can be, that can have uh, math operations performed on this structure. So, you know, a common example is you, it, with some of these vectorization techniques, you could do a math operation like king minus, um, king minus queen equals like, or king and queen is the same thing. Like the difference between king and queen has the same difference between like ma uh, man and woman, for example. Got so there's it. like, like, there's the, you can just like run math operations on this. But hmm. anyways, we somehow need to convert these rules into math. And right. that's going to be a very interesting problem. I don't know like how, how we can say that. What I, one of the things that I think we will have to do, which 
you know, I don't know how practical it is to just like give give a AI system rules like that or how that would work in practice. But it seems like we need to treat this AI system as a child. Mm -hmm. So so essentially there's a learning phase where it's, it's just observing. It's not taking any action, it's sort of like in a read only mode where it doesn't do anything, but it's it's taking in all this data and it's saying like, was this a good decision? Was this a bad decision? And it's almost like learning along the way and it's gonna need a lot of human input right. because there are so many edge cases. Like even in, like even if you take these, you know, never do harm to humans, maybe there are cases where harm needs to be done or maybe there's a very short term um, segment of suffering that needs to take place for a long-term gain. So if you like totally outlaw everything that's harmful to humans, maybe that's really cutting down some long-term possibilities in terms of the optimal, you know, outcome. Right. And it seems like this idea of setting a hard and fast maxim is mm -hmm. always problematic with unintended consequences. And this is right. goes back to the same sort of King Midas problem of you know, everything you touch turns to gold, like the machine is too good, like more so than you even thought. And so that's part of why it's so important to have meaningful human input as the machine grows and gets more intelligent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, na natural language processing is one of the biggest potential game changers once it's mm -hmm. figured out. Because if you yeah. can imagine that if Google or Apple or, or Baidu or, or some company is able to figure this out mm -hmm. once they can extract meaning from words in a meaningful way they could very quickly be fed all of the knowledge of all human history that's been recorded and integrate that into its you know knowledge base yeah and i will say there are there have been some really interesting results in natural language processing so there was a big um, story sometime uh, either at the end of 2018 or early 2019. Uh, OpenAI developed something called, some model called GPT-2, which is essentially a natural language mm. processing thing. And they didn't even release the source code to the public because they thought it would be problematic. So mm. this model or the system could generate text in a pretty accurate way. So like sometimes it was totally indistinguishable from human text generation. And you could ask it a question, like, you know, tell me, or like, when did King Midas, you know, you know, when did, you know, when did some event happen in history and what was the context around, or like, why did this happen in history? Mm -hmm. And some of these questions were actually like, real, or some of these answers were super coherent that this model was able yeah. to like, right back in text to a pretty complicated question. Well, dude, it's getting a lot better. I mean, I, I just the other day I asked a question of Google mm -hmm. and I can't remember what it was, but it was like a pretty complex question. And then it just mm -hmm. answered it perfectly with just the right amount of detail, you know, enough so that it really answered your question, but not too much where you're like, okay, I get it. And yeah. that's hard to achieve. But there's yeah. so many human inputs with something like search and bouncing and the machine being able to learn what a human is actually looking for that mm -hmm. even in the time, you know, since we started Hence the Future, it's pretty amazing how much progress has been made. Um, yeah. And I do sort of want to, you know, take another step back and just think about all the different milestones up until now that we've achieved, because I think that'll give us a better sense of when we can predict that AGI will be achieved by humanity and that we can talk about maybe what some experts predict. And mm -hmm. I think the other important thing to consider with AI is that it's really good at a confined set of rules. So with something like chess, where there's a very clear cut universe of what you can do and what you can't do, that's something mm -hmm. that there will never be a human born that will be better than a chess program. Like yeah. that whole field has been has been mm -hmm. uh, seeded to AI. Yeah, and even Go at this point, probably. Right. And then obviously the most complex rural system is the real world, is, you know, walking around the real world, whatever it means mm -hmm. to flourish for humanity and for all of life to 
progress in some beneficial way. That's where we're aiming towards. And that's kind of what we mean by AGI is something Mm -hmm. that can really function in that realm of the real world. But let's just I just want to go through some of the milestones that have been achieved so far. So checkers in 1994, better than all humans, chess in 1997, better than all humans, Scrabble in 2006, Jeopardy in 2011, Go in 2017, Texas Hold'em Poker in 2017, Alibaba Language Processing, AI Beats Top Stanford Students in Reading and Comprehension Test in 2018. Wow. Google Duplex in 2018, not as good as human telemarketers, but it's considered high human ability, meaning it's better than most humans in like doing customer service type. Of, so that's like, we haven't really achieved it yet, but it's close. Mm-hmm. Uh, Google, better at spotting breast cancer than a human doctor in 2018. And this is superhuman. There will never be another human that's better at spotting breast cancer than the machine. There's 99% accuracy with the machine versus 81% accuracy with the human. Wow. Also in 2018, Dota 2, which is a pretty complex, you know, video game, computer game. Mm -hmm. Sort of like League of Legends, if listeners are familiar with that. But it's, it's interesting too, that the AI was interacting with all like it it was controlling an entire team right which is i find that pretty interesting and it's and it's more orchestrating everything it's also more similar to the real world than go or chess because you can't see the whole board at any given time like Mm -hmm. the whole idea of these games is like the basically reality renders as you move through the game so you have Mm -hmm. to have this really good sense of like taking in sensors and making actions without seeing the high level like what what's going on with with everything in the game Mm -hmm. and one i want to stay on that for a little bit because i watched the stream of the dota 2 um yeah the ai versus some uh professional gamers and they um so the commentators were like as they were going through, uh, the AI started making really weird decisions, and the commentators were like, "Dude, like, what do you like? What is the, what's going on right now? This doesn't even make any sense." <laughs> and then, what they didn't realize is it was a setup for like several minutes down the line, Ooh. and then it ended up winning. It was like a, a strategy that was super unconventional, but ended up working. And the same sort of thing happened with um, AlphaGo. Like it, it was using these really non-human strategies. And that's because it wasn't really constrained by our thinking. Right. And I think it would be good also to touch a little bit on like what the different systems are that were accomplishing these tasks. So like back when it was checkers or some of these simpler games with perfect information, it wasn't like a mm. straight machine learning. It was hard learning. coded. Into, yeah, some yeah. the rules were hard coded, and it was more of a computational feat than anything mm-hmm. else. Um, but Alpha whereas, Zero is the real where it all yeah. changed. So, so with with Dota Two, with Alpha Zero, things like that. Essentially, it's a game where you program the rules, and it starts off as a blank slate, sort of like what, mm-hmm. what we were talking about earlier. Um, but they use this technique called reinforcement learning, which is essentially a system will play against itself, but mm-hmm. it can play against itself orders of magnitude faster than a human could play against, you know, another human and learn. But it's, I mean, it's learning and playing thousands of games per day and learning and learning and learning and pretty much seeing all of these different strategies and it's creating its own artificial neural network. You know, I will right. say that it's specifically for go like it's not a system that will like if it's really good at go it's not going to be good at dota 2 or it's not even going to be good at chess you know Mm -hmm. it's specific to alpha go but you could take this reinforcement learning model and adjust it for any other type yeah you just the rules yeah the rules are a little bit different and the the same general reinforcement learning uh techniques are used you know in a fundamental sense you mm-hmm. just need to sort of change the value functions because sometimes the um, you know the 
the rules are a little bit different and sometimes the strategies and the, and the long-term thinking are a little bit different. Sometimes right. you have more information because with a Go board, it's perfect information. You know exactly where all the pieces are on the board at once. Mm-hmm. Whereas with Dota 2, like you were saying, there is imperfect information. So you need it needs to be a little bit more probabilistic. Right. Um, and, and one example is that in chess, you can play regular chess, but you could also play suicide chess where the goal is to lose. And it's really fun if you've ever played it. But huh. this is sort of a this is a good example of showing that we already have artificial general intelligence in a subhuman sense. Like it's not as good as all human tasks, but it is general mm-hmm. in the sense that you can we now have algorithms that will work with various sets, with various different rules. And it's not like you have to rebuild it all the way from the ground up. It does become, you do have to build something a little bit more sophisticated whenever we reach a new milestone. Like for instance, Mm -hmm. going from Go to Dota 2 achieved some additional, or or required some additional sophistication. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. we do, we are already starting to see, sort of starting to see this general intelligence emerge. So I just want to keep going to a couple things that are in the future, uh, Mm -hmm. at least that are predicted. Well, first, StarCraft in 2019, that has happened after Dota. It's still considered Mm -hmm. high human because it hasn't necessarily beaten the best player, but it'll beat like, you know, Mm -hmm. 99% of players. Yeah. Self-driving cars are expected to be better than the best human driver, at least by like, you know, accident rate. Mm-hmm. by 2020 or 2021 and that prediction is by elon musk so yeah. even if he's off by a year or two like you're never going to have a human that's a better driver than a car yeah and, and there are cases right now where that's already the case now it's not you know self-driving cars aren't better than humans in every single driving condition but mm-hmm. you know they're that's... already safer yeah, they're safer in, especially in like LA where it barely ever rains and, you know, the, it, it's really um, good infrastructure. So, you know, it's, I think self driving cars can really uh, do well in those sorts of conditions. Now, I'm interested to see how optimistic this is or what the reality of this is in a place, let's say like Seattle or somewhere where it just rains all the time, for example, Mm -hmm. and the conditions aren't perfect or in a more rural area where the, let's say the, um, the paint on the roads is faded and you can't really tell like where, where the lanes are. Like it's going to have to infer where the lanes are, which is a more difficult problem. So I think that on like with good infrastructure and with good weather conditions, it's probably, I think 2020 is very realistic. Um, yeah, I mean, Elon is saying this is all roads anywhere, even in Timbuktu, you know, dirt roads. Like, Interesting. Because he's basically the whole design of Tesla cars is made so that it can go on any road, whereas some other cars require, te- like, I forget the exact name of it, but they like shoot out all these little like, Low LIDAR. Res- LIDAR, yeah. yeah. Whereas LIDAR is a lot uh, a lot less applicable to areas that don't have clear-cut lines in the road and, and that sort of thing. Interesting. Yeah, because he's designing Tesla to basically only use camera sensors. And they, the reason for that is, one, it's a lot cheaper to use cameras. Mm-hmm. But it's also a very rich set of information as right. long as... You we have, have good image good recognition. Enough, you have good image recognition and you can reconstruct the image, you know, the whole surrounding of the mm-hmm. area. Because that's that's actually one of the things like for these AI systems to work, the data needs to be good. And so that means the sensors need to be really good. Right. Because right. without that, like that's the most fundamental part of these AI systems is having good data. Yeah. But yeah, and then there's, so there's a couple other projections. I don't know how accurate they are, but uh, one researcher projected that we'll be able to translate all languages better than any native speaker by 2024. That an AI will be able to write a high school essay better than any high schooler by 2026. That this this one I think is actually um, 
way too conservative, but working in retail, like an AI will be better than any retail worker by 2031. I mean, there's already Amazon Go stores that don't require like any retail people there. So I think that's a little too conservative. Yeah. Although maybe for, maybe for, like, for like the high end luxury. Yeah. For like a fancy stuff. boutique store where you have someone like personal relationship, obviously that's a different mm-hmm. case. Writing a New York Times bestseller by 2049, working as a surgeon by 2053. So those are all some projections. And to me, it seems like the most important use, the most important one of these areas is to actually build software. Like whenever we get to the point where an AI can build software, write code better than the best developer, that's really the tipping point where it's like, that's the holy shit moment. Mm -hmm. I think that will be more difficult than it sounds, given Mm -hmm. how um, compute, like it's not the same as writing an essay because you need to make sure that the structure of the program works and there's so many like edge cases. But at the same time, you know, AI systems might be able to develop their own language because I think really what would slow it down or like um, make it harder would be to use human invented programming languages. It would probably Mm. be easier for a system to write its own, you know, assembly code or like the lowest level machine code for some some programs. And there are a ton of um, program generators now i mean they're not generating new code for the most part i mean some of there are some out there i think uh google has some um that i think they're working on some of that kind of stuff with with their research but i'm really interested to see where that goes because what happens if they start developing their own neural network architectures for example or you know their their machine learning um, models Um, i mean it, it it could become the type of thing where in the shorter medium term it's basically just like an advancement of the no code movement where it's like the AI will build your whole website just based on what it knows about you and your brand and pull images from the web and write copy and everything. And then Mm -hmm. you just need to input like a few words of how you want it changed, like make it more professional or like make it a little more friendly or like mm-hmm. just whatever the lowest level human input is just to make it a little more like what you as the human would like it to be. And the AI pretty much does the rest because we're already at the stage where it's like, you know, drag and drop website builders where you're like, oh, I want a button and you drag it and the code is generated automatically. Like that didn't mm-hmm. used to be the case. So if you just take this trend forward into the future, it's going to be less and less need for human input, whereas mm-hmm. the machine will take over more and more of the onus. And eventually, the idea is that unless some some massive catastrophic event happens, we will get to the point where the machine can write its own code better than any human. Yeah, interesting. So I wonder if like a first step to that would be the uh, machine learning or the system orchestrating the data flow and like pretty much orchestrating the the app. You know, you design it, you kind of, you tell it what you want it to do, and this will kind of orchestrate all of the individual components. And then after that, you know, you said about typing in words, that, that's a interesting problem, because again, that means that the system will have to know what the meaning of these words are. Like, it'll have to really know what these, the meanings of these words are beyond what the mathematical representation of those. So here's another way. Maybe instead it'll just always provide you with a or B. Do you like this website or that website? And you just click on the one you like and however long you want to keep this exercise up, you can just keep refining where it just gives you different choices for reality and you choose the reality that you like best. That could be another way where it doesn't need to understand human language. Yeah, I think that's actually um, the best way to go forward. Sort of like the whole child uh, analogy from Mm -hmm. earlier. Like you just kind of tell it, okay, it it goes along and it's, you know, exploring different opportunities and it's a reinforcement learning problem. So that it would take a, it, it would take, a while but you know if all you had to do is click and figure out which was the best from a user perspective that would be 
a much lower skilled thing to do, which is good. And then you can focus on, you know, the more human centric things. And maybe that's what we're moving towards. We're maybe we're moving towards a world where engineering and programming is just all handled by these systems and yeah. that humans exist to be humans and to, right. you know, to, to have human connections and to be social. Yeah, they're just providing some inputs for what resonates with human beings. Mm-hmm. I mean, of, of yeah. course, the, the scary part is when you consider how fast these changes could occur, because this, this sort of uh, assumes that there's a similar time scale for humans and machines, where the machine gives you some choices, you give it feedback, then it creates the next version. But it mm-hmm. could be the case if... AI is more of an emergent phenomenon that it will progress so fast where overnight you wake up the next day and it's already completely remade your whole company or remade the whole government or remade all of the world. Yeah. And you didn't even have time to, to blink because the time scales are so different. And the, the reason for this is that electronic circuits move at about one million times as fast as biological circuits. So, you know, Sam Harris cites this, that one week of machine time is the equivalent of 20,000 years of human time. So, but based on that one million to one, you know, speed differential. So I wonder if I've had issue, I've, I've had issues with that analogy because I wonder if like biological systems and the processing in our brains are more information dense. So if you're talking about like a raw like information processing um, speed, I wonder if biological systems, due to the way that information is encoded, is maybe more rich than a digital system, where it's just zeros and ones and voltages. Right. I've I've had but, that thought. But the know. amount of hardware in one human brain versus the hardware we could put to use with one grand AI system. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's fairly humble, the amount of hardware that goes into human thinking. So if you're mm-hmm. comparing like one human brain versus like a potential machine that we could just put all of like all of Amazon's, you know, cloud servers to use, that yeah. could be potentially way faster and more powerful. But I, I see your point that human knowledge may be far more information dense, whereas yeah. some of the processing speeds of machines may be more of just like a simple transmission of bits. And, and maybe another thing, one of the other things I was thinking about uh, relating to um, brains versus these big supercomputing centers or these big supercomputers um, is the architecture itself. Like there's a limitation to the architecture that we can make classical in, computers. A, in classical computers because really almost i'm pretty sure every single feasible you know or useful deep learning system is just a feed forward neural network there might be some where there's like some sort of data transfer backwards mm-hmm. but really what happens in every case that i'm aware of is you feed in an input the data just continually gets transformed over and over until there's some output. Mm-hmm. And the problem with this is there is there is not really feedback to the point where like data flow. It's not like a cyclical graph. Whereas like in our brains, there our networks are you know we can have loops in our brains. We can have like really crazy things going on. And I think what that does is it really condenses the Mm. amount of space that is needed in our brain. So maybe it's less of a information density and more of a architectural density. So like more information can be processed um, in, you know, a biological system or our brains just because of the structure of the graph itself or the structure of our our neural network itself. So do you think Um, something like quantum computing could allow us to achieve a similar level of efficiency? So, yeah, that's kind of where I was going with Mm -hmm. with this, because the problem with these really complicated architectures is, well, I'll take a step back and say that really complicated neural network architectures were conceived many, many decades ago. The problem with deep neural networks, which is, you know, kind of the the fundamental machine learning 
um, architecture these days for a lot of tasks. I mean, there's there's tree-based um, machine learning models and stuff, but neural networks are typically what what's uh, thought about when we think about um, like machine learning, reinforcement learning, all of these major results that we've been talking about mm -hmm. uh, are primarily neural networks. Um, but anyways, those have a very specific architecture that are created because they are also easy to train, which means mm. they're easy they're easy models to tune the parameters, or like tune the structure of the graph. Um, and that's because there are huge limitations to the optimizations that we can use in classical systems. Right. Now, if we can use, if we can conceive of these really complicated architectures and use an optimization um, algorithm with a quantum computer, which can optimize things way faster, theoretically. I mean, right mm -hmm. now, you know, there's, there's not that much, um, Although Google I mean, Google did just recently announce quantum supremacy, which is defined as the point where a quantum computer can achieve a task that even the best classical computer could not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really important. They they say it's similar to how you know the first plane flight of the Wright brothers. You know, it's not like an like you're not gonna open up a commercial airline with that first plane. Like it's a very mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a first early step, but it makes a point. And the point is, mm -hmm. this is something that's possible, and this is only the beginning. And that's sort of where we are with quantum computers. Right. Yeah, and and there are, you know, we've we had a whole uh, podcast that I would recommend listeners go back and listen to. So there are companies like D-Wave that have uh, quantum annealers, which are essential. it's a type of optimization. But really what what a neural network is trying to do is adjust all of the parameters. So if you think of your neurons as um, these little points in a um, artificial network, and then the connections between the neurons as weights, we need to adjust those weights to basically do well at some sort of task. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, a, that's what the optimization is. So sometimes there are, you know, there's one natural language processing um, algorithm right now that's really popular, and it has 300 million parameters. So this this is essentially a program that tries to optimize 300 million different weights between wow. neurons. That's a insane optimization problem, and it's we can only approximate the true like best solution right. to that. And by weights, you mean sort of like a loss function? Yeah, where it's... yeah. so the weights, Cause the, I know for the inst... loss function informs the weights, essentially. Okay, because I know, for instance, like when Google started out with its image recognition, they just had all the same weights. But then they realized mm -hmm. that they needed to modify it so that some really embarrassing things don't happen. Like there's the famous example of you know, when you typed in, when you, when you looked at images of African Americans, sometimes it would inaccurately say, "Oh, that's a gorilla," and there was this huge uproar yeah. where people said, "Oh, this is bias in data. This is racist. This is wrong." Mm -hmm. So Google basically modified the loss function to say, "If there is even a slight chance of this not being a gorilla, just refuse to label this image mm -hmm. because the yeah. downside is so great." Whereas the downside yeah. of like mistaking a chicken or a rooster is like, there's no downside. So go ahead. Even if you have a 51% probability of it being a rooster, just say it's a rooster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is a, um, that's not the weights that I was talking about, but that's like a, almost like a, a post processing thing. So it's like rules after the fact, once a prediction is made, it seems like what they're doing is probably just saying, okay, if these are the results and like having hard coded rules to right, these, to right. the output, just like another filter. Um, then, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. And with, um, so what are the weights that you were talking about? So if you think of every single connection between every single neuron in our brain, mm -hmm. if let's just pretend that our brain is somehow represented in a computer, um, the weights is like a number that represents the connection between two neurons. So if hmm. you have 
a weight that is higher, that means that there's like a higher number that's being sent, or let's say a, a higher voltage that's being sent to the next layer of the neural network. That's a really simple, like, um, it, it's maybe oversimplified, but it's essentially defining how connected two neurons are, whether they're unconnected or very connected. Well, I, I read this book uh, called Surfaces and Essences. I think I told you about it before. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. I've it's, heard of it. it basically tries to map out the brain in this way that you describe and it talks mm -hmm. about how you know some of the first things that a baby thinks of is is like peekaboo like either it's there or it's not so that's like sort of mm -hmm. their first concept it's like and every baby will laugh when you say like yeah like oh peekaboo or like you uh -huh. or like a baby will like knock over its plate of spaghetti and then laugh and then you give it another plate and then it knocks it out again and it just laughs <laughs> But then the other things is the idea of mom and the idea of dad are so deeply ingrained. And from that, you get all of these other concepts like the motherland, the mothership, the motherboard, like, mm -hmm. you know, you, or like your father, like you get this idea of God and this like patriarchy. And like, mm -hmm. it's like so many ideas that we think of as unique are actually you know, sort of stemming off from those more core ideas that are ingrained in us yeah. from very little. Is that kind of similar to how these yeah. neural nets yeah, are so built? Yeah, so that's actually a very, that's sort of the, um, the inspiration of how these neural networks are built. And it's easier to think about this when we think of image recognition. So mm -hmm. let's think of a this hypothetical neural network that has four layers. There's one layer that has a bunch of neurons and then all those neurons feed input to the next layer. And then all those neurons feed input to the next layer. And all of the connections between neurons from the previous layer to a ne the next layer have some weight, which I was describing earlier. Mm -hmm. Typically what will happen is the earlier layers define very high level concepts or high level features of an image. So maybe they'll recognize edges or they'll recognize um or sorry so the very um lowest layers rec represent very low level features and then by the time we get to the very end maybe all the input feeds into like recognizing an eye or an ear mm. or a nose or a mouth and and that's sort of how they work in a super basic sense is that they each layer kind of adds one level of abstraction to it um, it's kind of like when to you're putting input. together a puzzle and it's easiest first to do like the sky and then to do all yes. the edges yeah. and mm -hmm. yeah and that's sort of how how they they work and that's just how how it naturally progresses when you um do these these uh training like when you're training a neural network right uh, and it's, it's it worth... would be oh go ahead well, I was just going to say that it's it's worth noting that, you know, as we talk about AGI, we already have machines that are so far superior to us in all these narrow aspects. So like, you know, chess, for instance, calculations, you know, with your Excel documents or even something like image recognition is getting almost as good as humans. Even something like facial recognition is getting almost as good as humans, you know, speech mm -hmm. recognition. Uh, transcribing, natural language processing. These are all areas where we are getting to the point where in any of these narrow realms, we're getting mm -hmm. to the point where not only is it going to be better than any human, there will never be a human that's anywhere close to as good as the machine. Mm -hmm. so, it, so AGI to a large extent is like, will there be a point or when will there be a point where we kind of weave all of these capabilities together? And, you know, for myself, it's easiest to think about it in regards to an AI assistant, like your, your Google Home or your mm -hmm. Siri or your Alexa, because these already sort of take in all this information and can tell you whatever answer they have. Not only that, they can actually do things for you. They can already, you know, my, my Google can turn off my lights. It can add things to mm -hmm. my calendar. It can remind me. It can set alarms. So you know, when will it expand to include all possible capabilities? So I just wanted to say like what some of the predictions are of experts. So it gives us a sense mm -hmm. of the time horizon. And then mm -hmm. we can maybe think about how it's likely to, to play out from here. So 
it's really fascinating seeing when experts predict AI, AGI will be achieved. So there were four polls conducted in 2012 and 2013 of just you know hundreds or maybe even thousands of AI researchers, and the median estimate was between 2040 and 2050 for when we'll achieve AGI. An interesting point is that Asian researchers actually think it's going to be far sooner than North American researchers. So at the time when this poll was conducted, on average, not median, but average, Asian Asian researchers predicted that it would take 30 years for machines to, quote, accomplish every task, whereas North American researchers said that it would take 74 years to accomplish every task. So it's, hmm. it's interesting that that people in Asia are so much more bullish on this than us, which makes me think that perhaps they're further along than us, or maybe they, they just don't, um, they don't see the intrinsic value of, of human input as being as important as we do. That would be the more mm-hmm. uh, generous interpretation from an American perspective. Mm-hmm. And then just a few other notable figures. So, Ray Kurzweil thinks that we will achieve AGI by 2029. That's even sooner. Hans Moravec thinks it'll happen by 2040. And Gordon E. Moore, the inventor of Moore's Law, thinks we will never achieve AGI. So uh, my question to you is, what do you think? Do you think that 2040 to 2050 is conservative, aggressive? Do you think, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are as far as the timeline yeah so i've changed my mind on this recently i used to be more in line with the like 2040 2050 like sometime within you know my mid lifetime you know in the 2050 ish range plus or minus a decade but i actually don't think that ai systems are as good as we think they are for like for example let's take image recognition Mm-hmm. Um, which is something that humans are far superior than um, computers are in general. You know, there are cases where, you know, if you if you're looking at a, you know, an MRI or a CAT scan, then they can pick out um, little pieces of, you know, they can p- detect cancer where the human eye can't really mm-hmm. pick that detail out. But at the same time, there are humans are far more efficient at learning than uh, any AI system in terms of image recognition in particular. So if we see a fire truck once in our lifetimes, we will know exactly what a fire truck is for the rest of our lives. If you show only one example, one picture of a fire truck to a image classifier, there's no way that it's always going to know what a um, a fire truck looks like. And that's because we don't have, I don't think we have an architecture that's even close to being, um, AGI capable because there's so many different tasks that need to be integrated. Like being able to be more efficient at learning what a cat is or a fire truck or something along those lines, as well as every single natural language processing task as well as every other narrow AI system, I think integrating all of those narrow AIs together is going to be way more difficult than we think it is. Hmm. And I, I think really a prerequisite to AGI is going to be quantum computing. I don't think we're going to be able to achieve it with something that's feasible with only classical computers because I don't think the architecture required to do something AGI like is possible to train on a classical computer within the time of the universe. Mm -hmm. You know, there are just things that are not solvable by classical computers. And I think that solving and optimizing a AGI like system on classical computers is not going to work. And, you know, I think we need to take more, we need to know more about the human brain we need to know more about the difference between the intelligence levels of us and let's say chimpanzees, for example. And I don't know if we've like really figured out 
what the difference is between I, – I mean, yes, we, we know some brain structure differences, but I just don't think we know enough about the human brain and right. what's required. So I'm, I've sort of adjusted my estimate to be more on the scale of like beyond our lifetime, um, more in the 2100s, like the, the 22nd century at some okay. point. Um, so yeah, yeah this, I'm a little this, more this bullish right. than you, but I, <laughs> I respect your take. I mean, I guess from my perspective, we always tend to overestimate what can happen in a year and underestimate what can happen in a decade. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, iPhone have only been around for 11 years and it's hard to even imagine the world before iPhone. So when we think yeah. about like a decade in the future or two decades in the future or three decades or four decades, I just can't imagine it taking mm -hmm. more than three or four decades from now, mm -hmm. um, just given the rate of progress. And, you know, you do have some people like Peter Thiel and Eric Weinstein who say that progress has actually been slowing. And to a certain extent, it has. You know, I would say people mm -hmm. are getting dumber and mm -hmm. our institutions are failing us but there has still been far greater progress in the last year or few years than the rest of human history you know up until like the 1890s or, or 1880s um, so mm -hmm. i mean and he shows like nick bostrom starts his ted talk by showing this chart of just gdp from the beginning of humanity until now and it's almost a perfectly straight line up and mm -hmm. it's like okay well how can we continue that exponential of a curve it seems like the only way is with something like agi and you may be mm -hmm. right that it will take longer than we think for for a machine to truly handle every single task like, mm -hmm. you know, recognizing sorts of objects or doing things that are more creative or have more of a human touch. You know, I certainly think that could take longer. But as far as when will it be able to handle everything that's relevant for generating GDP, like things that mm -hmm. are relevant economically, I think that can be achieved far before we have true AGI. And yes. it might be good, you know, next to talk about what are some of the impacts on society as we develop AGI or even as we develop just far better narrow AI? Mm -hmm. Because Yeah, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is if there is a, even just a good narrow AI in whatever sector, which does already exist. So for example, Google's search artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms are way better than Bing's search. And that's creating an economic disadvantage or sorry an economic advantage for google because their ai systems are better and it it's almost like this cascading effect where the, the it's a winner take all better, scenario yeah yeah so the yeah. the more search they get the better data they get and it's just mm -hmm. this this cascading effect where there's there's no way that bing can ever catch up to google at this point Right, and the same thing is happening in the driving world of self-driving cars where Uber knows if they're not one of the first companies to develop, to develop fully autonomous cars, they're going to be out of business within a few years. Mm -hmm. you know, Tesla's already farther ahead than, than Uber. You know, Google's got their own car thing going on. Mm -hmm. And that is a winner-take-all scenario because once you develop the first fully autonomous self-driving car, that's a, that's approved to be on the road without a human driver you're going to gain so much data that's going to help the system get better that for anyone mm -hmm. to catch up and then usurp your position is almost impossible at that point and it seems mm -hmm. like this trend is becoming true in many different industries like for instance you know i'm a i'm a digital marketer i could definitely imagine there being some sort of ai system within the next you know, 10 or 20 years that is basically able to create the ideal ad campaign, which is a relatively mm. defined set of rules, you know, like Go or Chess or whatever, where you just want to get the highest score based on click through rate, you know, conversion rate. You have these very obvious reward functions. And then the inputs are also pretty well defined. You have 
you know, your image inputs or video inputs that you can basically mm -hmm. pull from stock or creative commons websites. You write copy that, you know, based on all the analysis of which copy has performed well and to which audience, I could imagine some company creating a narrow AI that's able to predictably, you know, for every $1 you spend on Facebook, you get $2 back in profit or in revenue. And if whichever company does that will have an incredible advantage over any other marketing company or agency. And, and so if you play this out, it does seem like in the, you know, even like medium term, not far term, we will have trillionaires who are just absolutely crushing it in their industry. And then most people will be pretty much useless as far as like actually helping, you know, helping mm -hmm. the machine market better because it's just far superior. And or, yeah. or like a financial system, for instance, like, you know, I know you have a hedge fund, you could imagine mm -hmm. someone eventually creating a, a hedge fund algorithm that is just so far superior to anyone else because it just has access to way more data and like faster processing speeds mm -hmm. or whatever that it almost just becomes like unfair to all the other traders and everyone else just basically like decides to just use index funds because there's no way they can compete <laughs> with this. So it, yeah. it doesn't take AGI to totally disrupt society. All it takes is some very competent narrow AI in certain mm -hmm. fields. Yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with that. I think that I think there are going to be cases, though, where if we rely on AI too much, things can go very wrong. So there's a lot of research going into it. Let's talk about self-driving cars. And there's this thing called adversarial examples or um, well, essentially, a, a, an example like this is where you can feed input to a system and, like, ha let's say you, there's a little sign that would mess up whatever is being processed by Tesla's driving algorithms. And it would say, instead of this being a green light, or instead of this being a red light, it's a green light. And it can essentially hack a machine learning system. So mm. you, there's a lot of um, potential security vulnerabilities with this. And I think that, that that's something that we're going to really need to focus on if we, especially if these AI systems are making decisions. Now I could imagine someone writing a, a machine learning algorithm that performs well in the market, like a hedge fund for most cases, but since there's this degree of randomness and not perfect information in the markets, if it makes some big decision then it could totally bankrupt everybody involved in the hedge fund, right? Or, you know, it could make a decision that, that ruins everything and there are huge losses. It takes on too much risk. So there's like right. really, really, um, there's a lot of parameters that need to be tuned when we're thinking about how it's going, how these systems are going to interact with the real world. Um, so, I, I mean, I do think that pretty much everything will be disrupted and this is what we talked about like every time we talk about Andrew Yang like it doesn't there doesn't need to be AGI for truck drivers to go out of business or for right. them to be out of a job or for retail workers to be out of a job and pretty much any low skill repetitive job to be eliminated yeah and that's one one thing Andrew Yang talks about is that there is basically going to be two different classes in society in the future. There's going to be the class of people who are empowered by AI, mm -hmm. which is like an Amazon executive. And then there's the people who are essentially controlled by AI, like the Amazon worker in the fulfillment factory. Yep. Where you're a module that's an important human module because the machines haven't been able to figure out that piece of it yet. But that, you know, is not necessarily the most fulfilling life to just do something in a robotic way where you have to have the greatest level of efficiency and you're measured by all of these like really stringent parameters and basically limiting the limitation of human freedom is is perhaps the scariest piece of it at all, of all I mean even just considering self-driving cars it's like we could very well live in a world where our kids not only do they not know how to drive a car 
but they're not even allowed to go into manual mode in their cars anymore because it's been decided that it's just no no longer safe to let humans take over the wheel. And then mm-hmm. you're being tracked from every location where you go. And if there's any sort of anomaly, then it gets flagged. And then the cops ask you what you're up to. And it's like, you could imagine yeah. this like chipping away at human autonomy, which mm-hmm. is perhaps to me the most terrifying of all. Right. So I think it would be good now maybe to get into the future scenarios and yeah. think about what would the worst case be, the best case be, the most likely case be. All right, Justin, what is the worst case scenario for the future of artificial intelligence? Worst case scenario. Yeah, so I've been thinking a lot of this artificial general intelligence problem as essentially raising a child. And in the worst case, we essentially raise a child that's a psychopath that doesn't actually understand the emotions of others. And it's, it's like a, a mathematical representation. Like it's, it's totally disconnected from others. And I think one of the things that makes humans good is that we can really put ourselves in the shoes of another. Like we can truly empathize with another human because we're both humans or because, you know, these two. Well, we're all earthlings. There's that yeah. biological, like we're all part of Gaia, whereas machines may not be part of Gaia. Yeah, it, it, that might be something that's totally separate from from us. And it might not even be capable of empathizing in the same way that humans are because it is not an earthling. And I, I worry that even if we align the incentives short term, there this the system is going to have to continually evolve like or it will by default continually evolve like that i don't think it's going to be considered a general intelligence unless this thing is constantly observing constantly interacting and testing out the environment and when it does that it's going to need to update its code it's going to need to be able to update its you know its architecture and if it updates its architecture too much what happens if you know that breaks some fundamental connection to humans or let's say it can figure out a way to work around the value function that we've Mm -hmm. tried to put into math right Right. so I, i think that it could truly be a scenario where it just like humans are just a nuisance and it's like okay like even if it's aligned in the short to medium term or even even over the next couple centuries, if it's aligned and then something happens and something just fundamentally switches in this, this system, then it could totally be misaligned by, you know, by the very nature of itself being able to evolve. And I don't, again, I don't think it's going to be an AGI unless it can evolve itself the same way that human brain structures can evolve themselves. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much the worst case is we, we develop a superhuman psychopath. That's and does that, the does worst. that mean the end of the human race or what's the yes. end result? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, the yeah. end is just the human race. Like it, we're done and maybe it's the end of biological life and maybe, maybe yeah. it still has the, the incentive of discovering everything, but in its quest to discover everything, it also destroys things that we would consider precious mm. and you know i just view that as a, a terrible scenario like the the it could get to the point where you know millions of years down the line it's destroyed everything that humans could have you know made connection with or it, it destroyed every civilizations every civilization that humans could have contacted mm. and learned from so yeah that's a pretty doom and gloom far out worst case but yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this gets back to the gorilla problem, which Stuart mm-hmm. Russell brings up. And that problem is that anytime you engineer something that's more intelligent than your own species, you're essentially putting the fate of your species in the hands of, this, of your successor. So yeah. 
it's not like it actually happened this way, but in his example, it's like you can imagine the gorillas all sitting around like, should we create humans or, or not? And then they're like, yeah, you know, the, the humans have been, you know, I think we should. But then now it's like, what, what would they say? Like, was it a good idea to create humans? Well, their whole fate is dependent on how we actually address deforestation and climate mm -hmm. change. And, you know, if you've been listening to Hence the Future, you know that we're not doing too great in that regard. You know, West Borneo, mm -hmm. which is where a lot of these gorillas live, is being completely deforested for palm oil. And you can imagine a similar situation where the machines just have goals that are misaligned from our own. And therefore, they, you know, set forth in this direction without giving much concern to humankind. So my worst case scenario is similar to yours in that it means that we don't solve the value alignment problem. We don't solve the control problem. So it's, there's no re easy way for us to turn the AI off once it's bad because a sub goal of whatever its high level goal would be don't die before you achieve the goal. Even if we don't explicitly code that into the machine, it's a it's an implicit goal for pretty much any goal. And the, the quote Stuart Russell uses is, you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. So mm -hmm. it makes sense to disable your off switch so that you can achieve your goal of fetching the coffee for your human. And that could apply to mm -hmm. almost any sort of goal. Yeah. And yeah, so that would be my like worst, worst case scenario is that for whatever reason, all like atoms in Earth or, or all human atoms or whatever are basically reassembled for some other means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, my like second worst case, which is not quite as bad, would be that a group that does not have our values or the values of freedom as part of their value function are the first to develop AGI. So you could imagine if a company in China developed AGI and they they code into that value that they don't they don't care much about freedom about human freedom they care more mm -hmm. about control and obeying the rules mm -hmm. then that could essentially create a scenario that's like you know big brother 1984 mm -hmm. but even way worse cuz there's just no chance of of uh you know escaping the gaze of the AI or, or doing anything that's against the rules because you basically have this dictatorial AI overlord that makes sure that everyone's doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing at any given time. And this is essentially a reality where it's like we all become Amazon factory fulfillment workers. <laughs> like we have yeah. to keep doing our goal. And if we don't keep doing what the AI thinks we should be doing, even if it's for a good utilitarian purpose, like, the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, then we still become slaves and our freedom is totally minimized to the point where it, it essentially disappears. We have no freedom. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's really, that seems like it's more likely too. Yeah, yeah. It's... One of the things that I've also been thinking about is if even if the values are like, mostly aligned like let's say the goal was to really achieve human flourishing and human freedom mm -hmm. so really you, every rule that we could think of it it truly does optimize those things but in order to get to those things there needs to be short-term sacrifices and in a lot of cases there needs to be short-term sacrifices what if those short-term sacrifices are too great but it you know we don't we can't control that Every single villain, you know, in major movies, or not every yeah, like single Thanos, one. like Thanos, for instance. Yeah, like they, they go into it with intentions similar, like trying to make the world a better place. But you could think of it having a similar right. response. So, so, for instance, if you code it into the value function of just realize human flourishing to the fullest extent, which just sounds like a fantastic value function. How do you weigh current humans versus future humans? Like maybe all future generations would be better off if we killed 90% of humans today just based mm -hmm. on climate change and whatever yeah. else. Like that obviously is not something we would want to happen being humans that live on Earth today, even if it is mm -hmm. better for humanity overall in the long term. 
So there's a lot of ways this could go bad. Maybe mm-hmm. now we turn to how it could go right. <laughs> yeah. Best case scenario. So what's your best case scenario for AI? Yeah, mine was sort of the the inverse of that. Instead of raising a psychopath, we raise something that surpasses humans in every possible way for the better, right? It, it surpasses us in terms of intelligence, in terms of empathy, in terms of love, in terms of literally everything. And it might turn out that we need to create something that is still sort of biological based because I'm still holding on to the idea and maybe this is wrong, but I'm holding on to the idea that we really just aren't going to achieve AGI with classical computers and like a purely machine based thing. Like we might even need to encode information either at a quantum level or maybe we encode DNA like at a molecular level because there are there are computer systems that are trying to uh, process like DNA information for example and they, instead of storing information in bits it's storing information in DNA like structures hmm. and that might be you know that might be one of the paths to AGI and if if something like this happens and it really is like a god and it's it's really here to promote current future earthlings not even just humans but it's just like creating a utopia for everyone in a good way because sometimes people think of utopia in the sense of like some people think utopia can go wrong right like utopia if things are too good then people don't progress Mm -hmm. but like you know if, if something is so intelligent you might be able to get around all that like it it knows what is best for humans what type of stresses are best for humans in terms of happiness and i can just you know in the best case it truly is like heaven right like the best mm-hmm. case is heaven the worst case is hell you know it, it could take on a religious notion essentially um where if we <laughs> if we're in this this you know heaven for all of our lives and maybe it maybe it makes us immortal. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe immortal is totally against what it means to be human and to be happy. Right, Um, right. But, you know, and the amount of progress that it can make is so unimaginable that we can explore the cosmos. Like, the Earth Mm -hmm. is just one step, and we just, I don't know, I just think this is us giving birth to something that's so great. It's almost like us giving birth to... A god yeah um, yeah and that's sort of what the best case is for me yeah I like that I had similarly ambitious goals for the best case <laughs> like for me it all comes down to maximizing human freedom mm-hmm. and that's different for different people so you know for instance my mom's idea of what the best possible future would be like is something more like an agrarian society where people are close to the land they mm. they're close-knit families it's really about what humanity has always been whereas mm. for myself it might be more that we go and we colonize the cosmos and we explore all possible life and we have super high tech and maybe we even escape the confines of our three-dimensional reality and we actually become higher dimensional beings where mm. we can traverse not only space but also time and so in that sense we are immortal and right, yeah. it's like you could imagine us being pulled up to that higher level of, of dimensionality where even though it was really scary for us to make that leap from the first place, once you're in that higher dimension, you just see things from a much more all encompassing perspective. Mm-hmm. And because I believe there are many different flavors of consciousness and different, you know, there's so mm-hmm. many different spectrums of how you can sense what reality is that essentially the best case could be that you basically rather than having a trickle of inputs of what reality is you get more of like a river of you really just can you know comprehend Mm. what reality is and and play a part however you decide but only if that's what you want if that's not what you want i believe you still should have the ability to have you know live in some nice agrarian home with like a little cottage and you're you've got a little fire and you're telling stories with your friends and you know for some people that may be their 
their heaven in, in your terms. So mm -hmm. that's what it all comes down to for me is, is maximizing human freedom. And maybe part of that is even creating virtual worlds so that everyone can sort of live in their idealized mm -hmm. version of reality. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's like my sort of best, best possible case, which is probably a little cinematic <laughs> and far fetched for what some of our listeners may think. But so I'll bring it down to more of a, you know, near term, what could be possible. So my best mm -hmm. case in the short term is that the first company to develop AGI is a company like Apple, a company that values privacy while also valuing freedom while valuing empowering people. And, you know, interestingly, they have actually made the most AI company acquisitions of any of the major AI players in America. So Apple has acquired 20 AI companies, where the second most is Google. Mm -hmm. The other big players are Amazon, Microsoft, and, uh, and Facebook yeah. in America. Yeah. So I, I think if, if Apple became the first one that truly had an AGI and your Siri could sort of do whatever you want, I feel like Apple's value system is probably the closest aligned of those big players mm -hmm. to what we would want. So that could be a way for us to have a far greater degree of freedom just because you could think whatever you want and then the system would help you achieve that so long as it doesn't infringe on other people's mm -hmm rights and what they want to do with their sense of freedom right and okay. i think part of that would necessarily involve ubi because if you have some percentage of people that have this great degree of freedom and autonomy not everyone is going to get it all at once so some people are going to be left out necessarily and even if we have a, a situation where some people are able to integrate themselves with machines through something like Neuralink, which we talked about in the future of brain machine interfaces, the earning potential of someone who integrates with Neuralink versus someone who doesn't could be dramatically different, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't want to necessarily leave everyone out to dry who doesn't want to plant a chip in their brain. So we're going to need to have policies that help people through UBI or, or, or expanded uh, you know, mm -hmm. safety net for society. So ultimately, people will have the choice if they want to, you know, quote, merge with AI or, you know, be part of the effort to colonize the cosmos and try mm -hmm. to be, try to extend their life and become a you know, multi-planetary, higher dimensional being. That's fine if that's what you want. Or if you want to just, you know, get your stipend every month and play Frisbee, that's fine, too. So yeah. that's my best case scenario is sort of everyone gets to realize their freedom to the greatest possible extent without infringing on the freedom of others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So then um, what do you think about the most likely scenario? Most likely scenario. Yeah, this one I struggled with. So in the short term, I believe the race for AGI will continue to ramp up. And I, I actually mm -hmm. saw this graph from CB Insights that shows the number of AI acquisitions by Fortune 500 companies. And the frequency is like, not that frequent, not that frequent, super, super, super frequent. So it is ramping up to the degree that companies really realize that this is a winner take all scenario. You know, we talked mm -hmm. about Uber versus Tesla and self-driving car technology is an existential threat to any current transportation company. The same is true mm -hmm. with almost every sector of society. So I believe that this will result in a small number of trillionaires who are able to figure it out and a lot of people that only survive by the grace of those that have the means. And my hope is that because there's such a rallying cry of we need to take care of our fellow man that we will mm -hmm. implement the right policies and everyone will have enough to get by even if they're not able to contribute to society to you know really in really any meaningful way regarding gdp compared to you know the few that are able to develop these systems 
that can mm -hmm. just do the work of like unlimited human capabilities. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and then one thing I will say that's likely that I don't like, but I actually do think it's likely is the gradual loss of autonomy. I think we've seen that where there's less and less privacy each year and there's more and more oversight with security and tracking movements and, and uh, you know, the loss of ability to drive your car manually. I do think that there's going to be a loss of autonomy. I also think that people are going to get dumber and worse at doing a lot of stuff. So the same way we've already gotten worse at like directions. Exactly. If we over rely on this kind of stuff. So there's this interesting distinction between what are called cooperative artifacts and what are called competitive artifacts. So a cooperative hmm. artifact is using an abacus, for instance, like if you spend all day in your ancient Roman market, using an abacus to tally up all the purchases of togas from your store, mm -hmm. then even when you don't have the abacus around, you're thinking about math in that way. And you actually become better at arithmetic from having used mm. the abacus. So that's a mm. cooperative artifact. But a competitive artifact is like, if you just, you know, let's say you drive to work every day like I do, and then all of a sudden you get a self-driving car. How good at driving are you going to be you know, 10 years after only using a self-driving car, you're going to be a shit driver because you haven't mm -hmm. had any practice. So I think there's going to be more and more of these areas where there's competitive artifacts so that because mm. someone no longer has to remember any fact because Google has all the facts, you no yeah. longer have to even write a good essay because an algorithm can write a better essay than any high schooler. You know, you no longer have to drive a car. You no longer have to, like there are so few things you're going to have to do because technology won't already have a solution for it that I do think humanity on a whole is going to get dumber and less competent and there's going to be even fewer people that are relevant for pushing the fields forward and those people are going to become super powerful and wealthy and only by mm -hmm. their grace are the other people going to be able to live a good life. Interesting. I wonder if on, you know, another way to look at that would be like, we're just stripping away the things that make us, you know, less human. Like maybe instead of focusing on stuff like driving or these, these really technical things, maybe our IQs drop, but maybe our EQs rise, like our emotional, that could um, be, yeah. you know, we, we're very, we become more social. Although creatures. emotion recognition from videos and images is getting pretty damn good too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, but but there's still a difference. Well, you know, I think that it's. I don't know. No, it, we could see is... a boom in like poetry and artwork and podcasters and yeah. You know, there will be some fields that will be fine. I'm just saying, on a whole, like when you consider what someone in ancient Greece had to know to function in their society. That person, in a lot of regards, was probably smarter than like a modern American, just based oh, on yeah. how much easier the average American has it. And yeah, I mean, we don't have to remember anything. We don't have. To, I mean, we just go and look at Google every time we need an answer. So like our memories are becoming worse, and like there's very clear signs of like us getting dumber. Um, mm -hmm. But to some extent, you know, we're also. It's almost like we're maybe our like biological brains are getting dumber, but we're more in line with like merging with technology. Like we're getting closer to a merge. And when we merge, that's when, you know, the real magic happens. Like there is right, right. There's a, a merging with, you know, a, a neural link type of um, device where we can just think and things happen. So essentially we are thinking, but some of the processing of our thinking is just, you know, being done yeah. in the cloud. Um, I mean, in order so. to compete in 50 years from now, you may feel like you need to have Neuralink implanted. Mm -hmm. Or you may think, you know what, I just want to live a nice life and play Frisbee in the grass and hang out with my dog. And it does yeah. seem like there could be those two different paths. Like if you actually want to contribute and control AI, it's mm -hmm. never been more competitive. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's, there's a lot um, that 
could happen with with AI for sure. So I guess with with my likely, I, I had a, some similar thoughts. Um, so on a more worst case likely scenario, I think the country that's most poised to you know take advantage of AI and maybe um, develop the best systems is a company that has the best data, assuming that you know the architectures that are developed are relatively open source and published. So anytime there's a new uh, discovery, that's probably published by some academic. Now, then if that's the case, if the architectures are public and um, any country or any organization can use those architectures and they just need better data, I think China has the best data mm-hmm. because they're 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 not so siloed. The U.S. is siloed by company. Like it's Amazon isn't a U.S. run organization. Google isn't a U.S. run organization. Whereas with China, there are you know the country is running companies or is at least mm-hmm. very connected to these companies. So they have search data. They have e-commerce data. They have all the data from you know the cameras and the facial recognition stuff we've talked about they have payment data the chinese government literally has everything about their population and let's say let's be generous to well maybe not generous but let's say that the us is the same way and does actually have access to all the united states citizens data mm-hmm. china still has way more citizens and still is generating way more data than we are so not only do I think that they're generating like more data per person, they're generating, they have more people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that that's, you know, putting China in a better position to potentially take advantage of artificial intelligence. Um, now I will also say that I don't think that necessarily means that they will, it'll be a winner take all scenario in that sense, because I think it's more complicated than than that because i still don't think agi is going to be developed until the next century um Mm. the other thing that's working for us is that it does seem like there's been a backlash of china since the hong kong stuff and the nba uh you know misstep so it may be that even though right now china has a big advantage maybe in the future other European countries will be more willing to share data with the U.S. because they can sort of see this Mm -hmm. dichotomy of future scenarios. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, right now, China definitely has a major advantage when it comes to data Mm -hmm. availability. Yeah. And then I guess uh, besides that, I I think that that doesn't necessarily put U.S. at the biggest disadvantage, uh, depending on how it's used, because it'll still probably just be narrow AI, and I imagine that China will probably still use most of their systems in terms of controlling their citizens, which doesn't necessarily help its place in the rest of the world. You know, I think the, um, the view of China internationally is probably just going to continue to plummet the more authoritarian they get. Like essentially at some point they're just going to be viewed as a very powerful version of North Korea. Like maybe not to that extreme, like their citizens aren't, you know. Well, they are. They have been isolating themselves more and more. Like you can't even really use an American credit card in China anymore. And you can't even use cash in a lot of places. So you really just are at a loss now if you go to China and you try to spend money to an increasing degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that it's not necessarily bad, but I do think at least right now they are in a pretty good um, situation to develop pretty good artificial intelligence. And they, you know, they already are developing some pretty good systems. And then now in terms of a more far out scenario, like let's say centuries potentially down the road, or, or maybe, you know, whenever AGI becomes a thing, I really do think that this whole conversation, artificial intelligence, and maybe maybe artificial is the wrong word. Maybe we're just giving birth to a new kind of intelligence, and maybe mm-hmm. it's part biological. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But super intelligence. Yeah, some sort of super intelligence. Like we're creating something. We're we're creating our successor to some extent. Mankind's what, last invention. 
Yeah, I mean, it it very well could be. Or we we create something and it humans can decide whether or not they want to, you know, be integrated or they can live a more agrarian lifestyle like you were saying um with you know with your moms but i i don't know i i really do think we are giving birth to something it's almost like we're we're the the caterpillar in the cocoon yeah. and at, at some point the butterfly will emerge from that cocoon yeah. like we're there's nothing like you said at the very beginning there's no law of physics that says that we are the apex of intelligent life and i don't think realistically we're going to evolve like our bodies i don't think are going to evolve faster than our innovations like our innovations and Mm -hmm. everything else uh, pertaining to artificial intelligence will evolve way faster than we could like a monkey might evolve into a human level intelligence at some point and we've, you know, we've, we should share that video on right. social media with, you know, there's a monkey that's using, um, Instagram, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, like perfectly, which is really cool to see. But, you know, anyways, well, the interesting scale, thing about monkeys is that from our common ancestor with, you know, chimps or gorillas until mm-hmm. humans was 250,000 generations approximately, which yeah. is a lot, you know, it's millions of years or whatever, but the amount of generations you can do with machines is like yeah. just yeah. A, a, a totally different time scale. So mm-hmm. you can just iterate of generations so much faster. Yeah. So, so I just think that the, the, the evolution beyond us will be what we create. It's not going to be some genetic mutation of humans and we, you know, there will be genetic mutations and we'll evolve to some extent, but it's, it's going we're going to look very similar to what we look like now by the time we develop AGI, I think. So, and once we do that, we've given birth to something and that something is going to interact with the universe and the cosmos and potentially just go out and explore and be hopefully a awesome child of ours, essentially, rather than a psychopathic child. Yeah, I mean, I we haven't touched on this, but it's important to also note that whether or not this is conscious is a big factor in whether we would consider it to be a good outcome or a bad outcome. Because mm-hmm. if we bring about something that, like you said, maybe we shouldn't call it artificial intelligence, maybe we should just say, if we bring about some super intelligence, whether it has a biological component or not, mm-hmm. that is conscious and has a greater capacity for pleasure and pain and hopes and mm-hmm. dreams and fulfillment than we humans have, then that would be a good outcome, even if humans are obliterated in the process. But if we bring mm-hmm. about a being that is not conscious and it obliterates all conscious beings, at least in our corner of the universe, that's mm-hmm. a horrible outcome. Right. And all you have to believe to think that this AGI will be attained at some point is that progress will continue and that even you, if it's slow, like yeah. it, it could take it could take thousands of years. It's still going to happen. Right. And that you can create something as intelligent with silicon as you could with biological materials. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. I mean, that's that's something that I think a lot of people have they don't when you're thinking about the, the skeptics in artificial intelligence, they don't think of you know the very long term and what happens then which is understandable i mean it could be they're like oh we don't have to worry about that and then you're like well when do you think it will occur they're like oh not till like 2050 and they're like dude that's like (laughs) right around the corner yeah you're not worried are you kidding yeah but Um, but i mean it could be it could be good i mean it could be especially if it's conscious like you said that could be a really interesting that might even be a good um follow-up podcast is you know conscious ai and that whole conversation well one thing i want to leave our listeners with is that how exciting of a time to be alive i mean no matter what happens the fact that we're able to witness the next chapter of intelligence you know even if it hasn't fully flourished in our lifetime and maybe only with our kids is it fully realized 
to be in this transitioning period is absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. And for as long as we're on this path, you know, we at Hence the Future will share our thoughts and, you know, we're all in this together. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. We will have more on this topic in the future. But for now, thank you all for listening. We're going to talk this has about been the future of artificial now, intelligence. What is and we'll happen, see you next time. And what will inevitably happen. The past, the present, and the future. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The past, the present, and the future. Baby. What's the world coming to? The past, the present, and the future. Hey futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.